Part 1. You will hear a conversation between a woman making inquiries and a school receptionist. First, you have some time to look at questions 1 to 6. Now we shall begin. You should answer the questions as you listen, because you will not hear the recording a second time. Listen carefully and answer questions 1 to 6. Good afternoon, Estelle speaking. What can I do for you? I was told that the school holds, um, adult education classes. Yes, it does. We run seven a week, three on Tuesdays and Thursdays, and one on Wednesdays. Are they all evening classes? No. Because of the number of people who work shifts these days, we've found there's quite a demand for day classes as well. Well, I don't work, and I really want to get out and meet people, so daytime or evening would suit me. What is it you're particularly interested in? Oh, anything, really. Okay. On Tuesdays, we have a writing workshop for those people who've always longed to write but are hesitant about putting pen to paper. Hmm. It's an evening class and runs from 6 to 7.30, but there is a restriction on numbers. Oh. Yes. The tutor has advised us to restrict participants to a maximum of 10 per session, so I'll have to check and let you know if there is room for you. Thank you. Also, on Tuesdays, there is a book club designed for older adults looking to be inspired, to learn and share insights with one another. Are there any restrictions on that? Not really, but you'd have to be able to read the prescribed book each week. Hmm. You have to read set books, do you? Yes, and keep up with the others by finishing one a week. I understand. What else do you have? There's a history group on Tuesdays as well, run by a researcher and historian who provides a fascinating glimpse for you into the lives and society around this area a hundred years ago. Hmm, I don't think so. Well, what about Scrabble Club on Wednesday? It's extremely popular, you know. Sounds good. What time? 2 to 3.30 in the afternoon. Yes, I think I could manage that. Well, if you like Scrabble, you might like to join the Chess Night on Thursday evenings. It's more for serious players, though. Unfortunately, I don't play chess. Would you be interested in cake decorating? Well, I do enjoy baking from time to time. Have you thought about decorated cakes, though? You know, they make a wonderful focal point of any special celebration. Maybe not. Before you hear the rest of the conversation, you have some time to look at questions 7 to 10. Now listen and answer questions 7 to 10. Look, I don't know if you'd be interested, but next month there's going to be an Adult Learners Week, and it's a great opportunity to learn something new and meet a lot of people. All the events are free, but booking is essential. What are the events? I'll give you a brief rundown, and if you decide there's something in it for you, I can send you all the details. Great! When is it? The first week in September, from the 1st to the 8th. Oh, are they all daytime events? Yes, but some are half-day and some are whole-day sessions. Can you just quickly tell me about the half-day ones, please? Okay. The Techno Expo will help you work with social networking tools and you can learn more about online privacy and security and online entertainment. That's Monday the 1st. In the morning? Actually, it's after lunch, from 1 to 4.30. What else is there in the afternoon? Well, on Wednesday, there's work-life balance. Understanding how to assess what you really value, the importance of balance and harmony in your life, and how to achieve it. That's another one I'd like to go to. Are there any more? No, no more half days in the afternoon. Wait a minute. There is a poetry event. What does that entail? Writing some inspirational poems and sharing them with the class. No, thank you. I'm not going to read my poems to other people. I know what you mean. One more thing. Can you tell me where all the events are being held? Yes, all the workshops are at the Central Library. Oh, good.
That's handy. That is the end of part one. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now turns to part two. Part two. You will hear a guide talking about a tourist program. First, you have some time to look at questions 11 to 14. Answer questions 11 to 14. Welcome to all of you. Can everyone see me and hear me? Good. My name's Kathy, and I'm here to tell you about the special programme of events going on here at the Royal Observatory. Yes, it's Doors Open Day here in Edinburgh, and we're delighted that you have chosen to make this very special building part of your own Open Doors Day experience. Now, I'll make a start with giving you some background information about the Doors Open event. Doors Open takes place every year in September and the observatory is one of the many buildings, 112 of them in fact, that open their doors to visitors for one weekend. And yes, there's absolutely no charge. It's all completely free. The observatory has been involved in this event for more than 20 years and every year we attract more and more visitors, like you, who want to find out more about great buildings in the city. And hopefully, you'll leave with a better understanding of the universe too. OK, now let's run through today's programme of events. There are many activities to choose from, so make sure you make the most of your visit. Now, there will be planetarium shows throughout the day. Now these will run four times, both today and tomorrow, Sunday. These are popular, so please note that we're operating a booking system for these shows. Tickets for the two shows we're running this morning, the first showing at 10.30 and the second at 11.30, will be available on a first-come, first-served basis, here at the Information Point. Tickets for the two afternoon shows at 2pm and then at 3pm will be released later on at midday. So booking is essential as spaces go very quickly. Now you have some time to look at questions 15 to 20. Answer questions 15 to 20. We also have some special tours of the observatory available. These include a tour of the telescope dome and visitors will even have the opportunity to get onto the roof. I hope that those of you who are interested are wearing your most comfortable shoes and that you can keep up the pace. It will be worth the effort of climbing all these stairs. You'll have stunning views over the city when you reach the top. Now, for those of you who want to take things at a more leisurely pace, there will be an opportunity to visit the Crawford Collection and learn about the instruments that have been built here and there will also be some items from the collection on view. For those of you who don't already know, the Crawford Collection is an astronomical library and not only that, it ranks as one of the most important astronomical libraries in the world. You are promised a real treat here. And it's great to have so many younger visitors here today. Now, we have a craft workshop for children here in the visitor centre where they can make their very own model of a telescope and colour their very own planet. Please note that all children must be accompanied by an adult. So, as you can see, it's a pretty full timetable and there's a lot going on. Now. Any questions? That is the end of part two. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now turns to part three. Part three. You will hear a conversation between a student called Mark and his teacher, Professor Jones. First, you have some time to look at questions 21 to 25. 
Now listen carefully and answer questions 21 to 25. Hello, Mark. What can I do for you? Oh, hi, Professor Jones. I've come to ask you a big favor. Let me guess, Mark. You want more time for your essay assignment. You're the third student I've seen today, all with the same request. It beats me why a few people leave their planning to the last minute and then think that they can come at a day's notice and get a reprieve. It's really not fair to all the students who are well-planned and organized, is it? Yes, you're right, and I'm really sorry I need to ask. I've never asked for an extension before. So, Mark, why should I grant you an extension when I said no to everyone else today? Well, Professor Jones, I really do have a valid reason. It's not just the usual, like I have a cold, and I have a certificate from my doctor, or my computer crashed and I lost all my data. I wouldn't bother you with those old excuses. You see, my twin brother was planning to get married next weekend, but last week his girlfriend told him the wedding was off, and he landed on my doorstep. He was really upset. I couldn't just tell him to go away because I was busy, and of course I would have had three assignments due this week, and all my study plans just went out the window. I see. So why didn't you come to see me a week ago when your brother first turned up? Because I was hoping I would still be able to get it done, but I just can't manage it. Well, actually I have written the required number of words more or less, but frankly I feel it's terrible. I don't want to let myself down by handing it in as it is at the moment, and I really don't want to drop my grade point average by getting a low mark on this assignment. Well, the course handbook states very clearly that at least five days' notice is required for any extension except in emergencies. Those rules were designed to make it fair for everyone, you see. You're supposed to submit a request on the proper form, and you can send it by email. And you also need to make an appointment and discuss your request in person, as you have done now. Your problem does come very squarely under the family issues category, so you probably would have got some extra time if you'd done that. I'm not really inclined to grant this request now, you know. Yes, I know I've really messed up. I suppose I'll just have to hand it in as it is and take a lower grade. Before you hear the rest of the conversation, you have some time to look at questions 26 to 30. Now listen and answer questions 26 to 30. Well, at least you've made a start, which is more than can be said for your other colleagues today. Have you got what you've done so far? Come on, we'll look through it together, and I'll see if I can make a few suggestions for a quick fix. How about that? Oh, thank you. Yes, uh, here it is on my laptop. Well, let's see. Let's start with the bibliography. Yes, you've consulted most of the sources I suggested, but you don't have any references of your own, and that was part of the task, wasn't it? You need at least three references of your own, see? Yes, I know. I did find one more. MacDonald and Ferris, 2014. Okay, that's a good one. I suggest you look at their reference list, too, and chase up a couple more from there. You should be able to find everything you need in the online library databases, especially Language Line. Yes, okay. So what about the essay structure and the argument? Are they okay, or am I barking up the wrong tree? Well, you just seem to jump straight into your first point here. I'm not sure where your essay is going. Where's the introduction? Oh, right. I always leave that till the end and write it after I've finished the rest of the essay. That way ties into what I've already written. Well, that's what we were taught in the study skills course, anyway. Yes, and you're quite right. So tell me about your ideas. What's your main argument? Well, I'm not really sure. I think I understand the three opposing theories okay, but I don't really have a strong opinion about which one is correct. I was more thinking of explaining them all as clearly as I can, and then giving the evidence for each one. I don't think there's a clear-cut right or wrong. Well, that's my opinion anyway. Do we need to say that one is better than the other two? No, you don't. And what you are planning to do is often the best way to go about it. Well, I've been skimming through what you've written while we've been talking, and one thing you definitely must do before you submit this assignment is to edit it for grammar and spelling mistakes. There are a lot of errors here, just simple things that are easy to fix. But still, I can see you've done the basic work 
and I do sympathize with your brother. It must be very difficult for him. So I'll give you one extra day on this essay. Oh, thank you, Professor Jones. Thank you. I'll hand it in before 5 p.m. on Wednesday, then. Yes, that's the final deadline. Goodbye now. That is the end of part three. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now it turns to part four. Part four. You will hear a talk given by a lecturer in the art history department. First, you have some time to look at questions 31 to 40. Listen carefully and answer questions 31 to 40. In this lecture today, I'm going to introduce you to an American painter, Charles Wilson Peale. You may be familiar with his portraits, but did you know that he never even saw a painting till he was a grown man? He was born in Maryland in 1741. His father died when he was nine, and the family struggled financially for the next few years, and Charles became a saddle-maker's apprentice. One day, he went to Norfolk for supplies, and there he saw paintings for the first time. He thought they were so bad that he felt sure he could do better, so he decided to make painting his career. In 1766, he went to London to study painting with Benjamin West. Whilst there, he painted this portrait in 1768, see slide 1, Pitt as a Roman senator. Notice how elaborately symbolical this portrait is. The symbolism arises, of course, from Pitt's famous speech to the British Parliament, where he draws an analogy between the ancient Roman Senate's view of a barbaric Britain and the prevailing European view of the time of a barbaric African continent fueling the slavery trade. Perhaps you didn't know that the Romans used Britons as slaves. But I digress. Back to Peel. He returned to America and in 1772 painted the first ever portrait of George Washington. See slide 2. In 1773, he painted a group portrait of himself, his wife, mother, brothers, sister, his old nurse, and an unidentified baby. Just look at the slide. This painting is simply called The Peel Family. And you can almost feel the exuberance of the family and their warmth towards one another. He enjoyed great success as a portraitist prior to the Revolution and served with distinction in the Revolution. During this time, he became friends with George Washington, Benjamin Franklin, and Thomas Jefferson. After the war, he continued to paint, and, when his wife died in the 1790s, as a result of her eleventh pregnancy, he remarried. He had seventeen children in all, naming the sons after famous painters or scientists. Although perhaps best known for his portraits of famous people, Peel liked novelty. Look at this slide of his two sons, Raphael and Titian, life-size, climbing a narrow stairway. This painting, The Staircase Group, 1795, was exhibited in a doorway as a trompe l'oeil. And it is said that it did, in fact, fool the eye of George Washington. Even as far back as 1772, we can see his desire for difference in Rachel weeping. It's a rather macabre portrait of his first wife crying over the death of one of their children, their daughter Margaret. I'd like to show you one more slide to demonstrate his innovative approach. This is a portrait of his brother, James, sitting at his desk at night, with only his face illuminated by a lamp. This was painted much later than the others, in 1822. You know, Peel believed anyone could learn to paint, and he taught painting to his brothers, sisters, sons, daughters, nephews, nieces, and other relatives. Four of his sons, Titian, Rubens, Rembrandt, and Raphael, became painters, as did his brother James. 
Before you hear the rest of the conversation, you have some time to look at questions. Before I finish, I'd like to tell you a bit more about Peel. He was active in politics for several years, and throughout his life, he maintained a lively interest in many branches of science. He was also an inventor who gained patents for a fireplace, porcelain false teeth, and a new kind of wooden bridge. He collaborated with Thomas Jefferson on what was known as the polygraph, a kind of portable writing desk. But it wasn't any ordinary desk. This one could make several copies of a manuscript at once. He also wrote papers on a wide variety of subjects, from hygiene to engineering. Oh, and he also tried his hand at inventing a fairly primitive but innovative motion picture technique, new types of eyeglasses, and a velocipede, which is a precursor to the bicycle. Now, some of the original velocipedes had pedals and some didn't. You sort of scooted along on them using your feet. Unfortunately, I can't remember which type it was that Peel worked on. He's also remembered for his work as a naturalist. He established the first scientific museum in America, and he even invented his own system of taxidermy. For those of you who aren't sure what taxidermy is, it's the art of preparing, stuffing, and presenting dead animals so that they appear lifelike. He was also well ahead of his time in that he placed his animals in a simulated natural environment. His most magnificent exhibit, however, was the complete skeleton of an extinct mammal known as a mastodon, which he helped excavate. The event was memorialized in his extraordinary painting, The Exhuming of the Mastodon. That is the end of part four. You now have half a minute to check your answers.
Thank you.